So next we have Morgan Riquet. She is going to be doing a dance movement and movement-based therapy session with us. Morgan is a licensed professional counselor and a board certified dance and movement therapist who received her master's in dance movement therapy and counseling from Drexel University. Morgan is currently a board member of the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Dance Therapy Association. She is program coordinator for Cancer Support Community of Greater Philadelphia and clinical director and head of clinical development for My Cocoon, a startup online counseling company. She additionally serves as adjunct faculty and graduate clinical supervisor at Drexel University and formerly at Jefferson University. Morgan has provided dance therapy and counseling in several settings, including schools, hospitals, and private practice. Throughout her career, Morgan has focused on research and clinical service to provide meaningful therapy for families, caregivers, and individuals with chronic, progressive, and advanced illness and chronic pain. Morgan firmly believes in the ability of movement and the body to allow access to wellness, healing, and meaning making for everyone, regardless of verbal or physical abilities. Morgan, I will let you take it away. Thanks. It's really strange to hear yourself introduced that way. <laughs> to that, so thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start a screen share because I do have a PowerPoint, and I also am going to set the intention now to be um, as streamlined as possible. I know I can be pretty wordy, and I want to be really mindful of time, and I can get like so excited about what I'm talking about that I can. Um, wax philosophical at times. So here's me setting my intention um, to be really clear in what I'm talking about. But give me just a second to screen share. And oh, look, already I'm not actually presenting yet. <laughs> There we go. All right. So, um, and it's moving on without me. Uh, so my name is Morgan, as she, as, as I was so kindly introduced by Rachel. Um, and what I really want to talk about today is the importance of childhood friendships and why it is so important that we help children who have experienced, experienced cancer um, connect back with their peers and the children around them and also help their peers connect to them. Uh, in this case, in schools and classrooms, but also at home, on the playground, and any other settings where they get to run into other children. Child's ability to engage, but also their ability to perceive that social engagement is available to them. And I really, really want to underscore that because we're going to come back to that a lot. It, it is complicated by the fact that even if these children are working on the skills and kind of ready to be back with their peers, they're not always able to recognize that their peers are available to them. There are some changes that happen um, through a cancer diagnosis and, and through recovery that can make it difficult for children to recognize that people are, are there and ready and willing. Um, so that piece we're going to circle back to. So I also want to define dance movement therapy. And the really academic version is that dance movement therapy is the psychotherapeutic use of movement and dance to support intellectual, emotional, and motor functions of the body. So, um, and that is as defined by the American Dance Therapy Association. Another way to say it might be that it is the use of movement in service of that mind-body-spirit connection, the way that our physical self and our emotional self and our mental self are just constantly in that feedback loop of each other and using movement as a way to enter that, that loop, those connections. There are a few tenets um, in dance movement therapy that I think are helpful to point out. One is that we have a developmental framework. Um, so we really look at what is developmentally appropriate in movement, 
where a person's movement skills should be, what is kind of crucial to the physical development at a certain age uh, for a child. Uh, we believe that change occurs in the context of a relationship, which is not unique to dance movement therapy, but important. Um, we really believe in the mind-body connection. We definitely believe that movement is communicative, that movement holds meaning, and that patterns of movement hold meaning, uh, and that movement for us is both a form of assessment and intervention. So we observe the movement patterns that are coming up. We can kind of take in the movement that someone is giving off to give us a sense of maybe um, you know, different, different functions that are happening for them psychosocially. And based on those observations and our movement with another person, then choose particular movements with intentionality to kind of intervene and introduce new experiences or changes for an individual. So it's therapy on a nonverbal level. Um, so I actually am going to, and here's what I don't know, how I don't know if it'll work, if it'll work if I switch to the video without having to close out and sign back on, but I'm going to let Lori Baldino, who is a dancer with therapist um, at Mattel Children's Hospital at UCLA and works with children in oncology. She explains it really well, but I also think it's going to give you an opportunity to see a brief glimpse of what dance movement therapy might look like if you haven't had the opportunity to see it, particularly in a medical setting. Um, so if I switch over, can you see this screen now that I'm on the video? Awesome. Great. No closing and opening. That's perfect. Oh, except for now my screen's doing something funny. There we go. Can you hear This is a board certified dance movement therapist, and I'm here at Mattel Children's Hospital at UCLA. And I was brought to the hospital to provide the first dance therapy program funded directly and solely by the Andrew Rizzo Foundation. Uh, dance movement therapy is defined by the American Dance Therapy Association as the psychotherapeutic use of movement as a process that furthers um, an individual's emotional, physical, uh, developmental, social well-being. Um, we use movement as a catalyst, as a means into the person's uh, inner feelings um, and as a way for them to express themselves and to be able to learn ways of coping, uh, ways of interacting with other people, and as a means uh, to really help them integrate their experiences. Dance movement therapy is not only the use of movement, um, which a lot of people can hear the word dance and think, oh, you must be teaching ballet or tap or jazz. Um, but the reason why we add that movement piece on is because movement and dance can be anything from breathing to the way our heart beats, to the way our posture is when we're sitting and communicating, the way we hold ourselves, the way um, a mother or family member might hold a child. Um, these are all ways of moving and expressing and movement is our innate way of communicating. It's something that we all naturally do. Whether you speak any um, different languages, everyone moves. It's something that we're all united with. I initially walk in and I do an assessment on how they're feeling in the moment. Um, what kind of level of pain they're having? What emotional state are they currently in? Is it a state that's new to them? Is it something um, familiar? And I do a warm up with them. Uh, the movement warm up looks similar to what you would see in, a, in an activity session where you're moving each part of your body. And then that gives me information into where they're holding certain re restrictions in their body. All right. So I'm going to stop it. I really just wanted to give you the opportunity to see a little bit of dance movement therapy because um, so often I get asked what it looks like and the answer is it is different every time I do it and in every setting that I do it in. Um, and it is so rare to get to see it in a medical setting and to get to see it happen. Even if it's happened in your building, it's happening behind closed doors. So I thought it would be really helpful to be able to just see a little glimpse of what that might look like. Um, I'll go back to this, but that is a little taste of dance movement therapy to give you a little insight. So with that said, going back to kind of this challenge that I was talking about finding in the literature around um, 
social engagement and social skills for children who have been on medical isolation or have had to restrict their kind of social interaction because of a cancer experience. This, oh, so first I'll, there's a, there's a quote. Um, children with cancer often consider isolation from peers to be the most difficult part of their experience. So there was one study that um, shared that children reported that as the biggest challenge they experienced. This slide, however, is actually a compilation of 13 different studies, <laughs> and I tried to condense them into one sort of readable slide rather than to take you through all of this evidence-based information. But here are some of the things that comes up in the literature. One is that active social engagement for children who have experienced cancer increases their social adjustment, their coping behaviors, their sense of positive experiences coming out of cancer treatment and positive experiences re-entering with their peer groups. But children with cancer tend to experience challenges with body image or a sense of identity, that kind of juxtaposition between healthy me and sick me once they're in recovery, um, once they're done with treatment physical changes, restrictions that are placed on them, even if they don't want them, if they're not ready for them, and some social skill changes. Uh, survivors of childhood cancer, um, in particular, I'm going to pull up a study, or I'm going to scroll so I get the numbers right, but the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which is a study that was done with just shy of 3,000 adolescent survivors of childhood cancer and their age-related siblings, so a total of 6,000 children, which is a really significant study. Um, these adolescents were 1.7 times more likely to display what the authors labeled as antisocial behaviors. And so in this case, it means social withdrawal, um, having negative peer interactions, just kind of um, you know, challenging their peers or feeling like things were going well, and feelings of being rejected. And almost as many of them reported higher levels, <clears throat> excuse me, of anxiety and depression. So these children do experience changes. The children are so resilient and I want to give them all the due credit for that, but it, it does affect them. Um, pediatric cancer, cancer patients in play, their play changes. The way their play looks is different. So they are less likely to engage their peers or once they're playing, they're more likely to do. And hopefully, I don't, I don't know if you've sent out handouts yet um, to everyone or not. I don't know if people have gotten that, but if not, I have shared um, there are handouts full of um, just what I call an intervention bank, but it's basically a list of these games and movement experiences that you can kind of take and try on. And I'll talk us through some of those. So, um, to kind of understand the way that these movement games are laid out a little bit, I am going to first say that I used a developmental model by um, Cohen and Walco, um, who have contributed significant literature to some of the research that I did. But they divided children into four age groups. They divided them into infant and early childhood, school aged, and adolescent. And <laughs> Excuse me. Um, pardon me. On the back end, I discovered that really for age groups was not enough differentiation. A five-year-old <coughs> falls into the school age as well as an 11-year-old and they are not the same child. And so if I could do this all over again, and when I do this again, because I plan to, I'm definitely going to break that apart a little more, but that's the way it's laid out for now. I have included um, the infant and the early childhood um, slides in here and some of the movement games in the materials that are in the handouts, only because there are times when maybe chronologically or physically or cognitively a child is one age, but emotionally or physically, they have found themselves in a different developmental level. 
whether it's because they have central nervous system involvement in a tumor and so some of their physical capabilities are taken away from them or whether it's just they're having a hard time coping and some of those core emotional pieces that they need to work on are you know really of a child who's a little bit of a younger age and that's that's fine and we want to recognize that children exist along that continuum so I'm not going to go through the slides necessarily, um, but they're here in case they get shared with you, and I would love them to be shared with you. So I'm going to breeze right through that. Oh, I am so sorry. It is the worst possible time to have a cold. Okay, so school age in this in this sense is five to twelve years, which again, huge age range. Um, and the way that these slides are laid out, at the top you'll see the age range, and the next thing down uh, is going to be the central kind of body or social experience that is going on in this age group. And then underneath that are some of the developmental goals and some of the ways that we want to support them in movement, the things that we want to think about. So for school-aged children, you're looking at body image and identity. Um, they start to get more complex as peer relationships kind of become more central to their development. Um, and for these children, physical changes have a much greater impact on their social functioning. Um, but interventions, the literature has found, uh, really are a little more concrete. We're trying to give these kids tools and skills. So we wanna offer them ways to do some social problem solving. We wanna help them process their illness information through movement or changes in their body image through movement and kind of give them specific strategies. And so I'm, I'm going to give you an example later on that helps kind of connect what that would look like in movement a little bit. Uh, we've kind of talked about that. Uh, so for adolescents, here being 13 to 18 years, uh, that self-concept and that focus on body image just gets so much more complex and their peer groups are so much more central to their experience and they have a real heightened awareness of body image and that makes movement 10 times more vulnerable i mean can you imagine asking a 15 year old to just kind of dance with you if they were you know in your peer group that the eye rolls that you might get um but it's because it's a very vulnerable place to be in i mean can i if I asked you all to stand up and like wiggle and do a little dance for me right now, you'd probably laugh at me and half of you would not do it. Um, and it, it's because it, it feels both vulnerable, um, but also, you know, there's a different dynamic than with their peers. And so there is this kind of increased need to um, focus on the verbal into the movement and allowing them independence and control, even when you are asking them to kind of get moving a little more. And really one of the biggest goals for adolescents is to help them create a dynamic body image, to help them integrate anything that has changed due to the illness and to understand that their body image is gonna to continue to change and develop forever in reality, mine still is, um, but to help them have experiences that allow them to do that. And so, um, I actually already talked about this a little bit. So preschool children in particular stand out because a lot of them are already in a school setting. They're in preschool or kindergarten, but on an emotional and, and emotional level and on a physical level, they tend to more reflect early childhood. So that's just worth noting. All right, so I took all of this crazy amount of information and tried to develop a model for choosing what the best movement games were that I could offer a child at each age and for each need. And so, let's see. There we go. There were some core social skills that came up in the literature that were key to all ages. And I'll read them off, but it was assertiveness, communication, cooperation, empathy, problem solving, 
and social initiation. So there's that initiation piece again. Which brings us to this, which looks crazy. Um, but this is the decision tree that I used when I was actually running this as an evidence-based practice, as an evidence-based model in a hospital. Um, clearly, that's not the way that you're going to be using it, but it gives you hopefully some understanding of how I kind of looked at the social concerns that I was seeing and made decisions from there. So um, for me, some, some things that came up in the literature when I was doing this work was that children who had changes in appearance, who had central nervous system involvement, or who were brand new to treatment were the most at risk for having some of these social skill challenges. So that was, for me, a first line of decision making. Beyond that was an understanding of the child's developmental age, and I cannot underscore enough that it might not be chronological. And from there, this is an example using the school aged, I looked at some of those common socially based concerns for children in that age group to see if that's what was going on. So maybe, you know, there's a child who is really having a hard time um, adapting their kind of responses, whether it's to their brother or their healthcare team, and they kind of just you know, there's that kid who always says no, no matter what it is, no, 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 no. And so that really kind of falls within that rigid social interaction um, place. So then I might look underneath that to see like, what can I, what can I do here to help them find new opportunities to build a new skill set through movement, through play, through games. Uh, so this slide is also, I, I need to say, that I developed a lot of the movement games that are in the handout, but a handful of them are not mine. And a handful of them came from other literature and then I expanded them or kind of adapted them for my work. So I need to give credit where credit is due. So that's what this slide is for. And it's also to say that what I came up with is purely suggestive and not prescriptive. Um, possibilities are boundless. I, there's totally my bias and what I came up with, it's my preference and way for working, um, but it's a starting place. So let's see. So if you're gonna play games with kids in general, but particularly if you're going to do movement in games for children who have had a cancer experience, there are some important things to consider. Things to do would be if mobility is a concern, then activities can utilize lightness and sustainment. And another way to say that might be gentleness or airiness and taking your time. Because what that does, particularly if there's central nervous system involvement or um, some real physical limitations, is it allows the other person a chance to think about what they want their body to do and organize their body into doing it and getting it out there. So if I am trying to play a quick game, they might not be able to keep up with me, but if I really can kind of take my time, they have an opportunity to join me before I'm done and they're not missing out. Uh, another thing to do is just finding and labeling that movement potential. So meaning, you know, saying like, oh, I, I saw your leg want to kick that ball. Can you give it a shot? Um, awareness of discomfort with any body changes that might produce anxiety or withdrawal. Just keeping an eye on, am I actually making this kid feel more anxious? And if that's the case, movement is not right here. We can let it go. Um, and then a little tip or trick is that rhythm and rhythmic structures can help support turn taking and joining somebody else. So I don't have to look at you, see you, I don't even have to be in the same room as you to know that da, 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 right, to respond to that or to be able to join you in a rhythm and clap along with you. So that call and response, that ability to be kind of in the same timing lets me know that you and I are together, even if I don't want to be within six feet of you. So some things not to do, a really good indicator that you got to set movement aside. Um, for some of these kids, some of these experiences really present in a, a more extreme way. And it's not all children, it's not even that many of them, but some of them 
really, really struggle. And so if you're seeing significant hyperactivity, like a, above and beyond what is typical for a child, um, emotional or physical withdrawal, if they're just kind of not there or if they just want to stay off to the side of the room or if they're hypersensitive, if a sideways glance cuts through them like you just told them the worst thing, then movement isn't the right space for them because it requires being seen and sometimes they might not want to be seen. Sorry. <laughs> also, if something isn't working or if a child has had enough, let it go. We're done. There's no reason to keep it going. And there's my little, there's my little frozen nod. Yeah. <sighs> so here's an example of one of the movement games that's in the handout. And I wish I could play it with you. I wish we were in person and I could make everybody stand up and do this. And I can't. So I'm going to talk you through it, which is far more boring. But here we go. So for school-aged children, one of the movement games is a start-stop walk. And this often, this can address some of those concerns around um, whether the child is concerned about their ability to cope in a social situation or if they're actually struggling, struggling to cope in social situations, if they've got kind of poor social problem-solving skills. Um, and one of the goals of this game is to offer them specific strategies and to increase that problem solving. So again, with this age, kind of those concrete skill building experiences are part of what we really want to emphasize. And so this is a way that a movement game can do that. Um, and again, those kind of six umbrella social uh, concepts, constructs that are addressed are assertiveness, communication, and problem solving. So this intervention, if we're going to introduce it to a child, we can talk about it's a way to practice um, our body language, the way that our bodies have things to say, even if we don't. We can talk about it in terms of standing up for what, what we want or learning how to say no and assertiveness. So we can frame it different ways. Um, but the way it works is, you know, me as the adult, and the child or two children, if they've got a good relationship going, stand on opposite ends of the room for each other, or at least with a significant distance apart. And one person is the mover and one person is the caller or it. And so it or the caller gets to stay in place and the other person starts moving towards them. And at any time, the person who is calling can say stop. And what we can do is help that child understand that stop isn't just a word, but that stop comes with a sense of verticality, that stop comes with opening your feet wide, so putting some space between your feet and kind of taking that wide, vertical, assertive stance, and that stop in this game comes with hand, right? So we're taking stop. We don't even have to say the word. We can take the word out of it, but the other person has to watch and know that when I change my body posture to this, freeze. And it's a game, right? How quickly can you get the other person to do it and they have to stop on a dime and freeze. And it becomes a game and it becomes an experience, but we're teaching that posture of assertiveness. We're teaching a willingness to say, you're as close as I want you to be. I'm getting uncomfortable, which those children really need to be able to say. And so then once we're frozen, you can even take it a step further. All right, I get to decide, did I stop you too soon? Am I gonna take my hand down and let you get a little closer? Or am I gonna tell you, I don't want you to move, but I think I could take a step closer. Or did I not put my hand up soon enough? And, and I, I gotta back up here. Like, this is too much in my personal space. And then you can play with it. What does it look like if you move quickly? How does a child feel if they move slowly? If they're in a space to process that, like, how do you feel if I run at you quickly? Oh, I don't like that. Oh, okay, okay. So maybe when we run at our brother, he doesn't like that either. But it, it offers opportunity for those conversations, but it also builds those skills inherently. And and it becomes part of the body vocabulary. So now the child knows what it looks like to say, mm, I'm uncomfortable, without having to say it like that. So this is an example. And there are several. 
Uh, see, I'm paying attention to time. Uh, so I'm going to quickly talk through a little vignette to give you a sense of how it might have looked um, and to give you a little bit of an actual story behind this work and one of these children. Uh, I'm going to talk about N. Uh, and of course, everything has been de-identified. I had permission to use de-identified kind of uh, narrative here from the family, from the child, well, from the family. Um, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to read it so I don't kind of go off script <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I will say at the beginning of our time together, of our work together, N and I, I was told that she was not going to want to work with me. She was going to want to have nothing to do with me. And that if she did work with me, chances are she was going to end our sessions early because that's what she did with everybody. She had little patience for anyone and she did not like her physical therapist and she did not like the nurses coming in and poking at her. And I do not blame her. So another piece of it though, is that her physical limitations, she also um, had, well, so let me take a step back and talk you through for her, she was on isolation when I was working with her and she did have central nervous system involvement. So it had really impacted her ability to move the way that she was used to. Uh, I think at the time that we were working together, she was, I'm trying to think, she was six or seven. So she was at the younger end. Um, but she also was having a lot of emotional response to all these physical changes. So she needed some help in emotional regulation, which kind of falls within that early childhood piece. So I was looking at lots of opportunities here to work with her. But back to my story, um, she, her physical changes left her very, very dependent upon other people and very much at the whim of what other people wanted to do with her and to her. And she, was cognitively sharp, man. She was she was on it. She had a very strong will and she made very clear decisions about joining or terminating her interactions. She knew what she wanted to do and what she didn't. She knew what activities interested her, but she was very quick to disengage and she was very easily upset and she was very easily emotionally overwhelmed. She went from smiles to tears very quickly and often with like no visible warning. You didn't know it was coming. You really thought things were going well and she would lose herself. She would break down. Um, and so I decided to use a game that came out of the early childhood games uh, called Bubble Pop, which you could imagine what that is. I would blow bubbles and we would pop them. And of course it would be maybe different body parts or, you know, pop them like different animals. Can we duck bite them? Can we do it with our nose? Can we do it with our feet? But what it did was it gave her the opportunity to show me when she was no longer interested because two things, bubbles embodied that kind of light sustained quality that I talked about. So not only did she have the chance to kind of rally her body behind her and get it to move, but she also had the opportunity to decide she was done and call it quits before I had already moved on to the next thing. And it really allowed her to kind of decrease that level of frustration that she had in a lot of her other social interactions that seemed to just move past her before she could really kind of pull her thoughts together because she was moving a little slower than she had been used to. And through that, she really kind of learned that emotional regulation piece and I learned her cues and I was able to kind of stop what I was doing before I was frustrating her to no end. And while I don't know what happened for her when she went back home with her siblings and her peers, what I do know is that at least in that setting and in those moments, she started to understand differently how to regulate her emotions which was gonna make it so much easier for her to tolerate other children who were going to move on faster than she did. She had learned skills, but I had to set the stage for that. And I did it through blowing bubbles and through popping bubbles together. So that is my little story about N. Being mindful of time, so I'm gonna rush right on through. And reflections on use, I have a lot of things to say, but 
if for the sake of time, there's one thing that I want to say in particular, and that is on the next slide, and that is uh, cultural considerations. I don't know if this could be talked about enough. It could be an entire dissertation, but what I did and any of these movement games that I have handed you and a lot of the research that I looked into does not explicitly address movement for children with varying cultural backgrounds. It's kind of done in a general sense. And I think that's a real deficit both to my work and to a lot of the work in the, the field that I was pulling evidence from. And I just wanna say that children should always be considered within their culture and within their family's social dynamic, right? You might have families that they're just huggers. They just are. And so it is not bizarre for this child to just invade your social space, right? It doesn't mean that they have some odd, bizarre attachment style. They just wanna hug you. Um, and the opposite, there are some children that don't want to be in close proximity with other people. And it's not because they're socially withdrawn or they're challenged, but just because that's culturally appropriate for them. So I don't think we could talk about this enough and I'm not gonna talk about it anymore, but I just needed to say that. Uh, so everything to say, take my movement games with a grain of salt. They're biased by my own biases, um, but please take them and use them and play with them. Uh, try to integrate them. See if you can start to notice the ways that those social skills that I talked about are actually showing up in movement, that it's not just about popping bubbles together, but you're teaching them how to be focused. You're teaching them how to be adaptable by going in different directions. You're teaching them how to slow down because bubbles don't move quickly. Um, so I'm hoping I'm kind of giving you some insight into how you can think about movement, not just as something fun, but really as a way to offer new experiences for these children when they have to go back to the really difficult task of figuring out how to connect with their peers after maybe they've been away for some time. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and I guess take questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan. That was so wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Morgan? Hi, Beth. Thanks. It really is. I so wish that I could have done this with everyone in person. It makes such a difference. But I appreciate anybody who was here. I feel like you could probably talk for a whole dissertation about this. Uh, yes. <laughs> Morgan, I have a question. Yeah. Um, it, this, is, this really requires a creative skill set. I think, and just being able to engage children in their, in their space, right? Mm -hmm. And so without ignoring the space that we're in, being so virtual and so removed from, from really all of that, you know, do you have suggestions on how to engage kids, how to use these skills in the world that we're living in today? Yeah, so I think a lot of dance movement therapists have been struggling, not struggling with this, but have certainly been faced with this lately, right? Like our field is the most physical in contact <laughs> that you could probably get, other than being the doctors and the nurses themselves. Um, and so I think we're learning that, but some of the things that I have found is that, um, you know, so let me reset myself. In terms of these games, I think one is to trust that you can rely on them. So I, I did, hopefully you actually got it, that the handouts. There are handouts that exist that are full of like... We have them. We have them and I'll, I'll put the plug in too that everybody will receive the handouts after the wow. session and they will be displayed on our website for people to access. Great, great. Um, so that said, trust them, you know, at least that creative energy doesn't have to go into making up what they are. Trust that they are sound and evidence-based. And in addition to that, um, I think the, just those skills of like 
treating the camera like it's a human being is really bizarre, but it works. Um, but there's nothing better than the, the self as um, the model and as the mirror. So a kid is not going to engage me and play any of these games, especially if they're somewhere else in a different screen if I'm not also like up and ready to go and committed to it. Um, so I think letting go even of feeling silly in doing it um, is helpful. I don't know if that's really a great answer. I think we're learning. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it takes time and practice. This is a world that we're all, you know, exploring <laughs> day in and day out. So I'm thinking about the teachers on the call and the people who are school professionals and there's in-person versus hybrid, right? So just kind of staying consistent with our interventions despite the platform, I guess, that we're intervening with. Yeah. Yeah, thank I you. do. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think probably more now than ever, um, and I don't think I'm saying anything that comes as a shock to anybody, that um, offering movement opportunities, even when you're on, on a Zoom, in Zoom classroom, is kind of crucial. Um, I do get to witness Zoom school, and it just, <laughs> my, my, like, I find myself wanting to sit like this right along with the kid, you know, and so just again offering even the chance to kind of get up and wiggle just kind of opens doors to um, to changes. It seems like we also had someone who is relating that to in-person school as well, how, um, you know, it's, we're not really moving together in the same way. Um, that we yeah, so we I... And I'm, I'm taking what you were saying before and kind of connecting that to the, to the message we got. Please correct me, Julie, if I'm, if I'm taking that in the wrong way. Um, or feel free to drop another question. But No, I mean, I think that, you know, and I'm in a school that's actually um, full day, all day. And we have kids that are in person and then hybrid at the same time. So we're juggling, you know, a class at the same time with students in the classroom and then some on the screen. So we have the luxury of um, getting whiplash, right? Because you're teaching in the classroom and then, you know, whipping your head around to the screen at the same time. But I think these activities, um, and I am anxious to see the other ones that you have as well for the students or the, you know, the, the one student that I end up seeing in, in my office, um, either in, in person or you know, through a Zoom call, if they're unfortunately not able to come in at the moment because they're not well, um, how to engage them and how to do that, or if they're re-entering, um, how to do that so they're not feeling, um, so they can feel part of the school or so they're not feeling isolated and all those different pieces and parts um, to be able to do that. Oh, I didn't even realize my video wasn't on, so I apologize. Um, and to, to do that, um, so that they can either be, feel part of the, the larger classroom or if they're not able to do that. I mean, I just think that it, it's definitely a juggling act for sure. Yeah. I'm sorry if you can hear, there's a sudden uprise of wailing in the, in the background in my house. So I'm sorry if you can hear that. All of my children are going at once. Um, no, I think, you know, some obvious things are just like props are right out, but they were out anyway, right? We're not gonna play with balls and scarves right now. But there is a concept in dance movement therapy and you've probably done it in, as like an icebreaker in some other contexts, but the concept of mirroring and, you know, just that is almost the most basic of dance movement therapy to see and be seen that anything I do, you're going to try to follow my movement and join me with it as if you're my reflection in a mirror. And that can be done on Zoom. I could ask everybody, to do this right along with me and you'd be able to keep up. And it doesn't require you being fully visible. It doesn't require you being able to move forward or back. And I think even taking it down to just that idea of, is there a way on a nonverbal level to help these kids feel like they are seeing and being seen? And so taking mirroring into different contexts, right? Like you might not be able to blow bubbles and then the other kid pop them, but you might be able to pretend you're popping bubbles in the same way and can we mirror each other doing that um 
Um, we might not be able to physically walk towards or, or away from each other, but we can change that into like, can I move and you say stop and I have to, I have to freeze. So it's still that idea of creating assertiveness. Um, but I would say mirroring each other is just kind of that core tenet that's going to start to allow those opportunities to bridge between one person and the other. Um, and also, I know I said it already, but rhythm is huge. Um, whether it's call and response, you know, I clap a rhythm and you have to clap it back to me, or whether I make up a rhythm and you have to join me. Um, that can happen across Zoom and classroom, even if you've got kids in different places at different times. And so I think looking at the ones that have rhythm, looking at the ones that have mirroring in them are probably going to be that much more accessible right now. And then praying that someday we'll all be back in person and we can actually touch the same things. <laughs> and so the rest of them are going to be valid again soon. No, those are good points. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? I, I told you I could talk about this topic all day. So I feel like my brain is in a thousand different places unless somebody has a question to actually like <laughs> pull me back together. I have a question. How, what was it like for you when you first kind of transitioned to practicing with children and families in person? to then kind of moving to this space that we're in now and um, as a clinician for me as a clinician I apologize for the personal question i'm just curious what you know this, it's not it sounds like this um this practice is so kind of close contact uh, yeah, so there was definitely a period of adjustment where, uh, particularly when I was actually doing like dance movement therapy work, um, and for people that I had been very much in a movement context with and less verbal, uh, that I, I felt like I was either floating in space, not actually anchored because I wasn't in that proximity, um, or on display. You know, because I was trying to make my whole self visible so that people could still see everything. And so I just kind of felt like I was floating far away from everyone else. Um, and then I went on maternity leave. So then I had four months of not even caring about, not that's not true, I cared about the work, but I did something else. <laughs> Three months of something else. And then I came back and I came back when other people had settled in. So I maybe have had a more unique experience because um, other people settled themselves and then I jumped back into it and now I feel like I've had the time away to be connected with my children so that I can come back and, and I've got that nourishment through my own kids so I don't feel as disconnected um, but I still I, I try to find different ways to kind of conduct the space that it feels like we are you know We'll play games that are like hand gestures to and away from the screen. So at least we can pretend that I'm coming close to you and I'm going away. Um, so I'm playing with it. I'm learning. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you can hear all of the wailing. <laughs> They're not happy. It is totally fine. We all are here because we work with kids, right? We all, we're all, we're all uh, in the world. We'll just join you in your world today. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have no other questions for Morgan, I, we're pretty much right on time. So we can kind of wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Morgan, for sharing this really unique practice with us. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining me. I, I hope I did not speed through it too hastily in, in hopes that I didn't talk myself over time which is what I tend to do I think I practiced it and it took me like an hour and 15 minutes and I was like well that doesn't work um, so hopefully it does feel like you you've gained something even if it's that you have to kind of go back and dig through it later to really figure out what it was that you heard um, hopefully I've kind of laid the foundation and I'm very grateful for everyone joining me and for you guys having me so thank you absolutely absolutely I think there's a lot of a lot of great tangible takeaways for people practicing in all different professions we have here with us today so, and we will we do have your handouts also which i know have all kinds of goodies inside that we'll be sharing with everyone who joined us wonderful so i'm gonna thank everyone for 
joining us for week one of our Strengthening Our Schools virtual education series. Um, recordings of today's session will be made available at the end of the three-week series. And we have our next sessions next week, um, October 16th, for two general sessions, Reducing Anxiety in Children, Acknowledging Secondary Trauma, and Answering Difficult Questions, How to Talk to Kids About Cancer. Thank you so much to Tara and Morgan and Kelly, who presented on the other side, for their wonderf wonderful presentations this afternoon. And we'll see you all next Friday. And if you have any questions um, in the meantime, uh, you should have our contact information or the contact information of Jesse, who um, can answer any of your questions. And um, we'll see you next week at 3 o'clock. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. have music ready like Jesse had ready. <laughs> Transitional music. Thank you everybody. Have a great day. Great weekend. Um, Rachel, you could probably stop recording. Okay. Let's see.